All right, good evening. We're glad you're here tonight. Welcome back to Wednesday Nights with First Baptist. Uh, we're calling it Wednesday Night Live and especially seeking to try to connect not only with people in the room, but also with those who are virtual. So thank you for everyone who's joining us online, and, um, and I'm looking forward to being back with you. I always miss the, the group, you know, the fellowship that we have together, and uh, just the opportunity to, uh, to bless one another. So, um, and I just want to say, you guys look good, all right? Y'all are, y'all are looking good. You're looking tanned from the summer. You had gotten a little pasty white, but now you're looking a whole lot better, and uh, I'm really glad to be with you. All right, so we're going to uh, have some creative elements as we um, have our Wednesday evening programs, and Jill Hobby is going to be helping us with those creative elements. So there's going to be a little bit of video, a little bit of singing uh, that we're going to incorporate. And so, Jill, I'm going to invite you to come on up and, um, well, I guess we're going to w- watch the video first, and then, Jill, you're going to come and kind of lead as that is wrapping up. So... Um, I'm just really excited for what Jill's going to be helping us with, and especially as we remember those uh, members that are, that are at home, maybe not able to participate with us uh, as a way to connect and include them in what we're doing on Wednesday nights. So again, welcome, and uh, let's check this video out. to Live on Location. Today, we're at Mildred Stanley Smith's house. Hey there, welcome. Come into my home. Hi, Mildred. I worship in this room because it's my angel room. I'm a collector of angels. Mildred, This angel room I know is your special place for watching the Sunday service on TV. And it's your special place because right now you're unable to come to the services. And it was such a long history of you coming to First Baptist. How many years have you been at First Baptist? Since 1973. 1973. And how many years were you in the choir? 1973 in and out with illness and family. And when you are getting ready to watch the Sunday service, what is it that you do to prepare yourself? I dress like I'm going to church. I love that. So you get up, get your hair and makeup done, just like you would normally do. Right. And then um, you come in here and sit on the couch to watch the TV where it plays. Right. When it's playing, do you sing along? I have my church program. They send it church program every week. And yes, I do. When you think about music and how it inspires you, do you listen to music throughout the week? 24 What has kept your faith strong? Well, the faith, what I've been through with God and the prayers, and I appreciate everybody's prayers they have said for me during this time, I would not be here if it wasn't for that. You've depended on the church family for lifting you up in prayer. And I know you've told me before about cards people have sent. I've got over 300 cards. And not only church, but out of state and different places that are my friends. When you are lonely uh, here by yourself, is there a scripture that you think of? I really don't get lonely. God's with me at all times. What do you think would be your favorite hymn? Hmm. Probably the old rugged cross. So will you join me along with Mildred watching and the other online viewers singing Mildred's favorite hymn, Chorus, The Old Rugged Cross. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross 
Till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday. Thank you so much to Mildred and to Jill for helping us to uh, have that moment together. If you know of someone who's at home, uh, maybe not, not able to um, attend in person, and you feel like they might welcome a visit and a little bit of video, um, then you can let me know or you can let Jill know. And uh, we plan to do this each week as we just celebrate our fellowship and, and all that God continues to do, um, whether we are in person or in our homes. So thank you so much, Jill. Thank you. Uh, for your creativity, and um, we look forward to future videos. I know a few announcements have already been mentioned, but um, I wanted to um, just call attention to the Bridge Luncheon, especially to ask you to pray for that as we restart that a week from today. We are hopeful to have a really good crowd that can join us for that hour of time together with a good meal as well as a uh, an encouraging word from Scripture, and uh, there's a little bit of uh, word in the bulletin about that and how you can share. Uh, then there's some other opportunities for service, uh, including um, uh, the upcoming um, uh, Care First Ministry, well, as they continue to need volunteers. And then um, a new thing of helping uh, international students in the United States. That's on the back page of your announcements, so you can check that out. And then finally, we have a, a new offering. Um, I love the, the uh, message this past Sunday from Chuck Bentley. We're going to be offering a Crown Financial Ministries Bible study. It's called the Bible, um, or it's called Money Life Personal Finance. And that's going to start on September the 11th in room 242 during the um, Sunday school hour. So if you are interested in learning more about how to be a better manager of what God has entrusted to you, if you want to just um, come along and kind of hear some new, new ideas, some scriptures maybe that you've not considered, um, whatever your motivation may be, check that out, and we would love to, for you to participate in that. All right, let's take a look at our prayer list for this evening. Um, we have a couple of people who are in rehab. Uh, Mary Helsley is one of them, and also uh, Judy Boswell, uh, after having a successful surgery, is now in recovery. Some of you may be aware uh, that Todd Nicholas had a, a very serious uh, motorcycle accident. Um, and uh, it was on Monday morning, I believe, is when it happened. He was on the Blue Ridge Parkway, and uh, just very, very severe. He, um, uh, he broke part of his, his back, uh, pelvis, ankle, ribs, sternum. He, it's, it's, a, it's an amazing gift that he is still alive. And so um, we want to be praying for him. He is still in Asheville, where he's had um, more than one surgery, and praying for his ongoing recovery, the work of the doctors, and then also for Ashley and for the kids uh, as they um, are, uh, are uh, standing beside him and, and dealing with um, what all of that means. We've had a couple of people who've been uh, continuing to battle COVID. Um, we're continuing to pray for um, Lib Neff, who has been ill with COVID. Uh, Pam Neal's mom has been sick with COVID, and, and we want to remember her tonight. Um, a few others that have had uh, surgery recently, Sidner Money, and then uh, Andy Edmondson had eye surgery recently, still in recovery. Uh, Pam Hunter with a dislocated hip, and, and quite a few others that are on our prayer list of people that are just, have really just been struggling recently. So um, we believe, as it says in the book of James, that the prayers of those who are righteous, those who are righteous in Christ, are powerful and effective. And so we're going to be praying for all of these by name this evening. One that we want to pray for, you'll see in our, in our missions side of the prayer list, um, uh, Black Seas Ministries uh, for Michael in the loss of his father. And so he's been traveling back to Knoxville uh, to be with family. Uh, let's be praying for Michael and Black Sea Ministries tonight. Are there others that you'd like for us to mention who are on our prayer list, maybe an update or someone new that we need to include?
So nobody comes to mind for you that you'd like to mention this evening that we can pray for as a family of faith? Okay. Um, uh, yeah. mm -hmm. the, the Scouting of America Troop Pack 50 in Carnes had two of their scouts commit suicide this week. And so <clears throat> they're re really trying to rally around and try to comfort all the children, other scouts, and the parents. So just keeping them in our thoughts and prayers. Okay, we will. Thank you. Hmm. What a tragedy. Yes, uh huh. Can we get the mic over to you so everyone can hear? I think a lot of people know that we're losing our Yvonne Satterfield. She's moving to Texas very soon, correct? August, August 29th, okay. So we want to pray for Yvonne as she leaves her family here because she has been so special to so many people, me especially. Love her to death. And um, she lost Sam earlier this year and she's moving out to Texas and going to be with her family out there. So please remember her in prayer as she moves to her new family. We will. Yeah. Thank you. Over to Perry right there. Yeah. I had the privilege of bringing uh, two children uh, to our music camp from our neighborhood. And uh, their grandmother, Sandy, has COVID. So I just wanted to remember her. Okay. We will. Okay. Anyone else we can pray for tonight? All right, here's what I'd like to do. Um, just take a moment um, around the tables. We've got sufficient kind of coverage all around the tables. What I'd like for you to take a moment is we, um, before we pray together as a family of faith, can you just share, each share one thing, uh, a word of praise or something that you're grateful for this evening. So something good God's done for you this week. Uh, take a moment, share those around the table, and then when I, I sense that we've kind of done that, I'm gonna pray for our family of faith, all right? So a word of praise, a word of gratitude, around the table. Go.
All right, have you all had a chance to share around the table? Nod your head, yes, if so, yes. Just about everybody, okay. Okay, let's pray together as a family of faith. I'm gonna read to you from Psalm 97, a word of scripture as we all bow our heads together. And let this word um, bring gladness to your heart as we look to our Heavenly Father. God's word says, light is sown for the righteous and joy for the upright of heart. Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous, and give thanks to his holy name. Our Heavenly Father, we belong to you, and our righteousness is only found in you, only by your blood, your sacrifice on the cross for us, O God, can we even approach your throne. But it says in the book of Hebrews, because of what you have done for us, that we can approach the throne not in a timid way, not so much out of a sense of fear, but with boldness. Because, oh God, we know that yours is a throne of mercy. So, oh God, we pray that as we come to you, that light would come upon us and that your joy would come into our hearts this evening for all that you continue to do. Oh God, our lives are far from perfect. God, we know that much is wrong and broken, not only in the world, but also, God, within our own hearts. And so we ask, O oh God, that you will come in and transform us, even tonight. God, that you would help us to become a little bit closer to Jesus Christ and to become more like him this evening. O oh God, we pray that tonight we will be emptied of all of our pride, of all contempt, of all anger and bitterness. And we pray, O oh God, that we might approach your throne so that you might grow the fruit of the Spirit within us, of love and peace of joy, of faithfulness and kindness and goodness and self-control. Oh, Lord, as we come before you tonight, uh, we know that there's healing that can be found in you. And so we pray, oh God, in that, in that Hebrews word of boldness, that you might comfort and touch those who are hurting this evening. We pray for those, Lord, who are still battling COVID, uh, for people like Lib Neff, and uh, also, Lord, for Pam's mother, and for Sandy, we pray, O oh God, that you will help Todd this evening, that you will give him your comfort, O oh God, and rest, that his pain might be under control, and that you will continue to work through doctors, nurses, and technicians to give Todd the best care that he can have so that he might be quicker along the path to recovery. We remember Mary and Judy tonight and ask that you will bless them at Well Park. May your Holy Spirit fill that place this evening even in their very rooms, God, so that they would know that you are with them and nothing's gonna change that. We pray for our sister Yvonne tonight. God, we love Yvonne. And we thank you for the many years that we've been blessed to have her here in Knoxville. We pray for traveling mercies for her as she goes to Texas and that you will bless this move, oh God, as she draws closer to family. Will you comfort her heart as she is missing Sam? God, we pray that you will continue to speak life into our congregation through your holy word, and that, God, that you would grow us in dependence upon your Holy Spirit. God, we know that it's only through your Holy Spirit that a spark can begin to take flame in our church, but we pray, God, that it would come. God, we pray that, that your word might light up our hearts and that, God, in fervent prayer, we would come before you on behalf of those who are lost, of those who are hurting God, for a world that desperately needs to know your name. God, we thank you for First Baptist. You've seen fit, oh God, for 180 years to bring this fellowship together. And we believe, God, that you still have a purpose for us. And so we ask, Lord, that you will fill us tonight, fill this very room with your Holy Spirit so that we might give you ever more glory. We pray in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Well, tonight we're going to share a little bit about our recent pilgrimage that we took to Alabama. This is a uh, trip that I'd heard about from the very beginning when I came to First Baptist about 18 months ago, um, a desire to go and, and to simply take in some of the civil rights uh, sites that are there and to learn something about uh, the history um, as, we, as we just think about um, uh, kind of the state of, of race in America today. It's a really informative uh, trip. It was a wonderful time being with the group. James, if you'll go ahead and pull up that, that PowerPoint. 
Um, and, uh, and tonight, I hope that you're blessed by this, and I hope that you hear something, maybe that kind of sparks a question in you or something uh, that you want to talk about this evening as we share our experiences. So I'm going to share a little bit about the trip in general, and then um, uh, I'm going to call on Kenny and uh, Jema is there, yep, and Janie's here too. So just to come up and share a little bit about their experiences and, and what, what, we, um, what we experienced together. So you can take a look there and see the name of the participants. We had a, a great group of 12, just a, just a van full. Um, and uh, that was just so much fun being with this crew, a very diverse group and uh, different, different um, uh, perspectives on things. And so we would get in the van and we would kind of talk about some of the things that were uh, on our minds as we were heading over to Alabama, some of our experiences around, uh, around race growing up and uh, present day experiences. So it's just a really, really rich experience. And I just love being with these people. I love this group and, um, and it was a gift to be together. So we had a little covenant. Um, I felt like this was important before we got on the road together. And um, I'm gonna, it may be difficult to read up here, but um, we just said, here are some things that we're gonna commit to doing together if we go on this journey, right? Because when you start talking about race, it can, it can get a little, you know, sometimes a little interesting, you know, and, and, um, and sometimes a little awkward, and sometimes we can kind of uh, get to a place where of disagreement. And so just some of the things that we talked about together, and we just all agreed to this by consensus, was about uh, seeking to be curious. You know, if you, if you bump into something you don't understand or someone's sharing an opinion you don't, you don't necessarily agree with that, well, um, rather than kind of go into a quick judgment, just kind of be curious. You know, why do you believe that? Um, why do you think that? Uh, preparing ourselves to be honest, participating. We ask everyone to bring their whole selves to this experience and, um, and to share that with others, uh, to affirm what others were saying before we weren't there to offer rebuttals or critiques. We weren't there to kind of fix each other, anything like that. It was a great atmosphere of respect. Uh, share respectfully, seek to understand by asking good questions, prayerful questions, and then also to uh, maintain confidentiality. So we said, you know, uh, whatever happens in the van stays in the van. Um, uh, whatever happens on the journey to Alabama, we're just going to leave it there. And um, I'm just really grateful for this crew that, that took this journey. So we, um, we traveled about four hours. And, and by the way, I don't know if you're aware, but I was born in Birmingham. And so this is a, this is a really uh, important place for me. And as I told the group, I um, didn't know much about the civil rights history until I, I became an adult. And uh, I had an opportunity to serve the group called the Alabama Cooperative Baptist Fellowship. And I would often welcome people to the state and they wanted to go to the civil rights sites. And so I said, okay, we'll go. And so over the, over the course of several years, I just did this kind of over and over, welcoming people to the state, going to the sites, talking about what happened and uh, sharing my own experience uh, as well. So we got to Birmingham, and first thing we did was go to Kelly Ingram Park. Now in downtown Birmingham, there are three things, four things really, or multiple things that are really close together. There's the Civil Rights Institute. Across the street is Kelly Ingram Park. Next to that is 16th Street Baptist Church. Two blocks over is the jail where uh, Martin Luther King wrote the letter from a Birmingham jail, uh, just uh, a document that still people study today. So the first thing we did was go to Kellerman Park, and this is where a lot of demonstrations took place. Uh, this is where um, you might have seen pictures of um, what happened in Birmingham, uh, especially during the, uh, the early 1960s, of um, fire hoses and dogs that were, that were used in order to, to have crowd control. So now what Kellerman Park is is kind of a memorial with all of these uh, statues and you can kind of see how some of them are they're meant to draw you in to help you see what happened and so like you can see um, that's Betsy Pickle right there and so you kind of walk through and these kind of kind of big dogs are kind of you know right around you and um, other you know other statues that kind of represent those that were uh, sent to jail because of protest uh, there's a memorial to Martin Luther King and other pastors who were, who were present. So just a really, um, uh, just a good kind of beginning to thinking about how 
the, the movement in Alabama was really a movement of faith. It was a lot of churches, a lot of religious leaders that were all coming together. There was a great sense of solidarity, and uh, a lot happened in uh, Kelly Ingram Park. So let's go to the next picture there. So after that, um, we went over to 16th Street Baptist Church. And by the way, how many people have been to um, 16th Street Baptist Church or to the Civil Rights Institute or anything like that? Nobody else? Okay, all right. Um, well, 16th Street Baptist Church is the place where um, uh, there was a bombing, September the 15th, 1963, and uh, on a Sunday, and four little girls were killed. They were kind of gathering in a little basement kind of kind of gathering area, and, um, and uh, just an unspeakable tragedy. Um, part of uh, many, many bombs that were going off all around Birmingham, churches that were being bombed, businesses bombed, just uh, got the nickname Bombingham over the, over the years. And so um, uh, this is a picture of a stained glass window that was put in really as kind of a memorial to the four little girls, but there's a, um, you can kind of see Christ on the cross. There's one hand that's kind of um, almost kind of like resisting, you know, like pushing back against against the, the hatred that people were experiencing, but then another open hand, uh, the hand of uh, working for a better day, the, the hand of grace. So just a beautiful picture that was there, very moving in the 16th Street Baptist Church. We couldn't take any pictures except in the sanctuary, but they had a really nice um, downstairs area that kind of told the story and, and the history of 16th Street Baptist Church. Um, I've known the pastor for uh, quite a few years, and. Um, they're, they're kind of a world uh, site. You know, people come from all over the world. So their, their motto is, Jesus is the main attraction, is what they say today, currently. You know, sort of an idea of we're still a vibrant church, we're still connecting, we're still growing, that kind of thing. Uh, so there's our crew that's over there on the right, just outside of 6th Street Baptist Church, and the bomb was set off just around the, the corner there. When the bomb went off, this stained glass window that, I'm, that I've got up there right now... Um, I'm trying to remember, there were a couple of places that were um, blown off due to the bomb, but one of them was the face of Christ, and uh, not much else, just a few little other places. So just a really poignant kind of symbol um, of Christ's face being missing in the midst of this, this bomb that, that, uh, that went off. So very, very moving to go there, you know, just to, to think about that and um, to try to understand <clears throat> what what the culture was like, what would perpetuate someone um, who would be willing to plant a bomb and, uh, and to kill people. So um, we were there at 16th Street maybe for about an hour, something like that, and then I, I don't think I've got a picture of, I don't, yeah, let's go back to the previous one, James. So then we went to the Civil Rights Institute, and that tells the story. Uh, it's right next door. That tells the story of um, a lot of what happened in Birmingham, but also all around the United States. It kind of traces the history of Birmingham and how it got to a place uh, like it did. Uh, it's really well done, very interactive. Um, it's been open now for about 20 years, something like that. A very moving kind of experience to go. It takes about an hour, hour and a half to go through. So then uh, our group went, after that, we went to, we took a drive to Montgomery, all right? Montgomery is about an hour and a half to the south. So we can go to the next slide there. Uh, we stayed the night in, in Montgomery, uh, just a few miles from where I grew up, went to high school. And uh, Susan Tatum and I both went to the same high school. I don't know if y'all knew that, but we both went to Jeff Davis High School in Montgomery. And uh, we stayed not far from there, and we went to um, three places in Montgomery. We went to a place called the Legacy Museum, then we went to the Lynching Memorial, and then we went to the Rosa Parks Museum. All of these very, very moving. Now, um, this is the Legacy Museum. It's, it's one of the newer museums in America. And uh, as you can see, it kind of traces the pathway from slavery to mass incarceration as kind of what is, um, uh, for many, many African Americans, it is the, one of the central issues um, of concern with so many African Americans being incarcerated today. So um, I pulled a few pictures off the web. You can't, you can't uh, take pictures on the inside of this, but go to the next slide there, James. Um, in fact, you can't even see this one very well. 
but you kind of go through and uh, just a very moving kind of demonstration of, of how uh, 12 million people were kidnapped from Africa, put on slave ships, 2 million people died on the way over to America as well as other places they were being taken. So really difficult, I mean, it's, 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 it's hard to see, you know? I mean, nothing, of course, remotely compared to what people actually experienced, but to hear the story, it's very, very hard. So um, we went to the Legacy Museum. It kind of culminates with some, um, you know, a lot of sort of demonstration around incarceration and, and uh, some issues related to that. Started by a guy named Brian Stevenson, who wrote a book called Just Mercy many years ago. He's sort of the, the instigator behind this, this work. Um, well, so another thing that's been developed is called the Lynching Museum. And uh, this is a very stark kind of place that memorializes 4,000 people who are known to have been lynched in America. So what you can see is like you go to these, um, it's almost like a, um, I don't know how to describe it, like a steel kind of coffin almost, um, but rusty kind of on the outside. And the imprint has the name of one or more persons and then the county where um, the lynching took place. So you can kind of see how here they're sort of on the ground, right? They're sort of positioned on the ground, but a little bit hanging. And then the more that you walk through the, the memorial, though, they start to be kind of lifted up higher and higher. So eventually you're sort of underneath them, and you can imagine, think about it, you know, what it would have, what it would have been like to see someone um, who, who was being lynched. There's a, there's a wall that's over here that sort of recognizes this is just the 4,000 people that could be identified, that there were, there were thousands more who were lynched over hundreds of years. Um, and, um, and often with a very uh, public uh, kind of justification, you know, saying, well, they'd committed a crime or done something and uh, deserving of, of being hanged. And so... Uh, very, very sobering experience, very sobering to, to go to this, this place. There's a little more to the, to the lynching museum of counties and thinking just about uh, the impact on families, but that was very moving. So then we um, finished up there, and we went on to the Rosa Parks Museum. Um, so just a little bit of uh, context. So the... Um, I'm trying to think about the bombing took place in 1963. The bus boycott was about eight years before that. And so that's when the time of the Montgomery bus boycott, there were other boycotts that were happening, but uh, you may know the story of Rosa Parks refusing to give up, give up her seat. And for um, over a year, there was this um, uh, boycott of, uh, of the buses and a great financial, you know, um, uh, trouble to the city, to kind of everything that was happening, certainly to the bus lines, and um, and uh, in the aftermath, um, uh, you know, uh, there were there were civil rights sort of laws that were passed, segregation. It was kind of that. It was the Montgomery bus boycott is credited with being the um, one of the biggest reasons why segregation was ultimately declared to be unconstitutional. That was sort of the big movement. At first, when the bus boycott happened they weren't actually demanding that they separate buses. Like, they, there would still be sort of a white and a, and a colored section, they called it. But o over time, the, the boycott uh, leaders began to see, no, I mean, segregation, we've really got to go for the root of kind of where this is. And, um, and ultimately, that was declared unconstitutional. Um, by the way, just go back there for one second, um, James. So... Uh, if you notice here at the bottom, it says that in the aftermath of the boycott, she and her husband were denied employment in, Mo in Montgomery. They couldn't get jobs, and so they went to Detroit. They left the, left the area. Um, uh, but she's credited with that courageous act, won the Presidential Medal of Freedom, and, and um, just you know, heralded as a, as, a, as a real icon for the civil rights movement. We went on from the Rose Parks Museum, uh, and, and all along the way, we're kind of learning together. We're, you know, having meals together, enjoying time, and, and uh, just sharing kind of conversation um, as we go, and just kind of talking about what we were feeling. Although, I did notice, maybe other group members could kind of talk to this. I think we kind of had a little trouble talking about these different places, right? Just a little bit. Like, you know, it was just so heavy. It's almost like... I need a couple of days to think about this before I can 
really talk about it. So um, I felt that even though what happened was through this journey, we were kind of learning together, we were thinking together, uh, sharing our own experiences, and that was just really, really rich. Well, we went on to Selma, and um, from there, uh, we spent some time at the Edmund Pettus Bridge, which is where Bloody Sunday took place. Now, this was in 1965, and um, learned the history of that and, and, and uh, what it would have been like, you know, crossing that bridge. We all walked together, um, and then um, spent a little bit of time kind of around the bridge, and then went to a place called the Interpretive Center, um, the Lowndes County Interpretive Center. And I want to pass this out, by the way. This is where I want to want to do this. There's a, there's a handout just coming to you. So what that uh, Lowndes County Interpretive Center does is tell the story of the, of the Selma to Montgomery march, um, 54 miles, and uh, what it would have been like for this group of people to, to come. By the time they reached Montgomery, there were 10,000 people that were marching together. And uh, part of the story in, in Lowndes County is um, it was one of the uh, most difficult places to register to vote, one of the most difficult places, and they gave statistics on just how few people were allowed to vote and how restrictive it was. And so what's being passed out to you right now is a, is a typical voting uh, or register to vote test for what you had to answer in order to uh, be able to vote. And so um, you kind of see some of those questions, like imagine if you had a, just, I mean, it's just ridiculous. I mean, like a, like a jar of jelly beans, you know, and t answer how many jelly beans are in the jar, you know? Um, how many bubbles are in a bar of soap? Um, uh, you know, just these kind of ridiculous kind of tests that, that essentially were designed to keep black people from registering, from voting. So printed out a copy for each of you to take a look at. It seems almost hard to believe <clears throat> that this actually happened, but, but nevertheless, it, it did. And so I think a lot of what our journey was about was trying to just understand just the scope of what it was like. Um, I know I came away just with sort of a greater understanding of why there continues to be so much tension in our society today and uh, also thinking about how I, how I can, you know, do more to uh, just to make friendships and to, um, uh, and to connect with people who are different from me. That was sort of my main takeaway. So I'm going to uh, call Kenny up here. Why don't you come on up and just share a couple of thoughts. And let's get that microphone, if you don't mind. Um, it's there in the back. Pam, if you don't mind, can we get that microphone? Um, and um, just ask them to share, just, to, just briefly, um, just some of what the experience was like. Um, I like went to sleep. <laughs> so yeah, this is Kenny Riffey, by the way. I'm so, Kenny Riffey. Hi. Thank you, Kenny. Well, I, Brent gave us some um, uh, prompts to think about before we spoke tonight. And I'm going to kind of go in reverse order. I will say that it was an extraordinary journey. It's some place I had wanted to go to, the Legacy Museum. Um, but where do we go from here? I'm gonna start with that because that's what I have pulled up on my cell phone right now. Tennessee actually still allows slavery. It's constitutional. I don't know if you know that. I didn't know that. And on November the 8th of 2022, we as a state get to vote to remove the allowing of slavery from the Constitution. And I hope that everybody goes out to vote. We went to, to Selma and we, we saw all about the march across the bridge and the right to vote and the difference voting can make. And I, I was amazed, startled, dumbfounded, whatever, that we still had slavery, um, slavery still allowed in the state of Tennessee per the Constitution. Uh, it is allowed for uh, punishment for crime. So we want to remove those words from our Constitution. We would not want that in the state of Tennessee. It's 2022. We should have moved on a long time ago. But anyway, so back to the Legacy Museum. That was the place I had really wanted to go. It touched me a lot. I knew some. I knew... Um, that, or I know that a lot of people see slavery as kind of the Mrs. Butterworth's syrup jar kind of slavery. 
it's all okay, happy, kind of gone with the windish sort of thing. But when you go see the facts, it was nothing close to that. And to see that, I knew that, that black people had been lynched in America. I did not know that 4,400 documented cases were out there. And that there are more, as Brent said, there are more that are unknown. The, um, the types of things that were done to them as well, in addition to lynching, the mutilation, the torture that preceded it, setting them on fire and then lynching them. And you say, what in somebody's mind makes that okay to do to another human being? So it was, uh, there was a lot to think about and I know we're supposed to keep it fairly short so I'll go ahead and pass the mic over to yeah. up, Jama Jane. or Janie, I don't wanna mm -hmm. take all the time. But while they're walking up here, um, on up. one of the things that, that is just so, when you, when you go to see this, you, it really brings home the fact that racism is a systemic problem in this country. And that where we are in a lot of cases, like from slavery to mass incarceration, um, it's still there. It just changes form. And the only way that we can make a change is to be aware of what's happened in the past and really make a concerted, focused effort to change it as we go along individually and to call people on it when we see it. <clears throat> well said. Um, when I was six years old, we went to the Philippines on a ship. When I went into the Legacy Museum, the first scene was a great big screen with an ocean coming at you, um, depicting the Middle Passage. And then you go into a room with a lot, with a multitude of heads, people floating in the water, it looks like faces, you see their faces. As soon as I saw that wall of water, I remembered leaving my grandparents and, and my cousins and my aunts and uncles and then leaving to come back, leaving my parents. And I, I was, I, I don't cry much, but I had a tear in my eye thinking of of millions of people being kidnapped away from their families. And, and so that was one of my biggest. And then you walk on in and see ghostly, um, uh, I forgot the word. Holograms? Holograms, thank you. Ghostly holograms of slaves in cells telling you their story. And, and one of them is singing and it's haunting and, and it, it's so real. That, the Legacy Museum, the whole thing, you get to listen to prisoners talking about their story of how they were incarcerated, although innocent. And um, so many things there to take in. It was hard to, hard to fathom and, and you would read and read and read and think, how could we do that? How? Why can't we see that all people are made in the image of God? Um, <clears throat> the thing I didn't know, uh, there were a lot of things I didn't know, but one of the things I didn't know was the test for voting and how ridiculous to ask somebody how many jelly beans in a jar and keep them from voting because they don't have the right answer. That's, that's just mean. And, not fair, and I didn't like it. Um, the most difficult thing I encountered, of course, was the lynching museum. And at the Legacy Museum, seeing um, depictions of lynchings, I didn't look. Uh, it was, sometimes I would walk by that part. I did um, listen to a video where they talked about lynchings one, at one point, and, and I just was appalled. It, it just makes me sad, um, learning the stories. Stories and memories are so meaningful, and they've done such a beautiful job at every place we went, sharing the story, because if we talk about it, then we can heal. We can have reconciliation if we talk about it. If we keep it hidden, if we say it doesn't exist, no healing will happen. Um, so I have a dream for how, how, to, how to affect Knoxville, how to, how to make a change here. 
my dream is for us to have a healthy relationship with our sister church, Mount Zion. And I would love to see us start that by maybe getting together for small group Bible studies just to read the Bible and talk about it. Because if we were just reading, not have a leader that's tell, expounding all the things about the Bible, but if we just would read the scripture like chapters together and then talk about it, we could learn from each other and share the love of Jesus together. And maybe that would bring some more healing and reconciliation too. Thank you, Jamie. Yeah, okay, Janie? Well, I would agree with the things that have already been said, but I think part of it for me was looking at the role of church in all of this that happened and the role that faith had and the faith that these people had. And, and I can tell you in asking myself about that, I'm not sure I would have had that because these people would meet and pray together and say, we're going out here because this is important knowing that they may not come back. I don't know that I have that kind of faith. And so the other side that we saw of that was their strength in faith, their strength in numbers in sharing that faith. The other side that we also saw was the complacency of other faiths and where the church didn't step up and didn't do what they could do. And when I thought about that, I thought, how has that changed? Or has it? And I thought about when we look back, you know, that, that this kind of thing really started in the Old Testament. It's not like this is new. Because a lot of this was about power, it was about money and greed. Where did that start? Well, Cain and Abel didn't get along very well. You know, we kind of saw, you've got what I want, I'm going to take it. It started pretty early on, but have we really progressed very far from that? And then I thought about the complacency part, and I thought, well, are, are we really, well, what does that look like? And I thought about Peter. God love him. Great guy, did a lot of great things. But when it really counted, when it really mattered, what was he most concerned about? Hey, you know, I don't, I don't really know this guy. I mean, you know, don't, you know, no, nah, I'm okay. Because it would have been inconvenient. It might have been dangerous. It might have been difficult for him. Not only did he believe that Jesus was his savior, but he was his friend. And yet, when it came to the point that it wasn't going to benefit him, it wasn't going to be easy for him. He denied him. And so I wonder as a church, whether it be us individually as a church or church in general, if we have become so content to remain complacent because it doesn't affect us. If it doesn't happen to our family, if it doesn't happen on our street, if it doesn't do anything to us, then is it really important? And so a couple of things that, that I thought of too is that, you know, when we talk about what kind of hatred would cause somebody to do some of the things that they did, where does that come from? And, and what I thought was a minority of haters can influence a majority of the unconcerned And if we don't care, and if we don't do anything, then that minority of people who hate and are destructive are going to always win. Okay, thank you, Janie. Thanks to Janie and Jama and uh, Kenny. Um, you can tell we were all deeply impacted uh, in different ways as we experienced this together. Um, and uh, just gave so much to think about uh, for the future. So I want to pause right here and just see if you've got any questions about the trip that we took or any comment that you'd like to make, um, kind of based on what you heard tonight. The 
4,000 that were lynched. No, all throughout the United States. Yeah, mostly in the South. Mm -hmm. So on each of those memorials, there was the county and the state where it happened. And often there was more than one name on, a, on one of those blocks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm struck by, uh, Janie mentioned the, the role of religion. <clears throat> In many ways, religion was used to justify segregation. But then I would say true religion was also at play to actually stand against. I mean, all the language of the civil rights movement is the language of faith. It's relying on the prophets. It's relying on Jesus. To me, it's a recovery of, uh, of if, if people have been living out the true faith of Christ, uh, what it would have looked like. So um, I came away with just a really um, contrast of how how hard it was to kind of hear all those things, but also just so inspired by those that lived out their faith, put their lives on the line uh, in order to uh, effect change. And I, I kind of came over with Janie, kind of that same question of, what would I have done? You know, would I have, would I have been willing to put my life on the line? Um, was just a very challenging question for me. So these are a couple of books that we read, if you're interested. Um, uh, one is called The Color of Compromise by Jamar Tisby, it's a newer book, and then Brian Stevenson, the guy that was the founder of the Legacy Museum, wrote Just Mercy. In fact, the book came out for many years, and it kind of led to the uh, greater conversation that happened in Montgomery through the Legacy Museum and the lynching memorial. So check those out if you're interested, uh, just a, um, a little kind of deeper dive. So we each read those before we went, and we talked about them uh, as, we, as we took the journey together. All right, so we're going to go ahead and wrap up for this evening. Thank you for being here tonight. Thanks for the first night back. Um, uh, I'm going to be starting a new series this Sunday called Every Sheep Matters is the name of that um, new series that deals with all the sheep shepherd metaphors that are in the Bible, uh, just the rich imagery that's there. And then, um, and then on Wednesday nights, we're going to be dealing with some other kind of corollary teachings around that as well. So it's going to be a good time together and uh, just glad that you're a part of it. So... All right, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your presence, God. Thank you for helping us to discern. God, help us as a family of faith. Um, as we seek, Lord, to stay united and together, Lord, that, um, that we might uh, together can just continue to learn and continue, God, to seek understanding. God, we do pray that you would make us a bridge-building church. Um, I pray like Jema has prayed, that we might have a richer relationship with our sister church, Mount Zion. In other ways, God, that we can show friendship and, um, and deepen relationships with people who may be different from us. God, we're so thankful for those opportunities because we know that those are based in the kingdom, God. They're gifts, and uh, we, we thank you for those relationships. To so be glorified in all that we say and do, and God, thank you for the body known as First Baptist. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.